So my name is Matthew Sykes Gelder, and I live in the village of Radelfingen, close to the capital Bern in Switzerland. So originally I'm from the UK. Uh, I've been, I grew up in the Birmingham area in England, and I've been living in Switzerland for 22 years. Uh, after my studies, I had the opportunity to, to find a job in Switzerland uh, 22 years ago. And, and I'm still here today. <laughs> so I must like it very much. We might have a visitor afterwards. There is a cat that's hanging around. So. <laughs> okay. That's why I'm getting a bit distracted. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to tell you about starting Iaido and Jodo. Um, so I go back to my childhood first, because uh, I was very uh, interested in uh, Asian martial arts. Uh, I especially like the TV series Monkey. I don't know if you know it. No. And also, no, uh, it's, uh, it was actually a Japanese TV series based on a Chinese uh, folklore story about uh, a monkey king and a uh, Buddhist monk. And there was a lot of uh, funny stories and interesting stories uh, that really influenced me a lot. Oh, but, cool. Uh, fasc fascinated me uh, quite a lot. Yeah, actually, that that um, fantasy or that um, from, the, from the Chinese history was very influential for from when I was growing up, too. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, actually, uh, the anime Dragon Ball was also based off of that. Okay. The story. Yeah, okay. I also like the series Kung Fu with David Carradine. Oh. Maybe you know this one. Yes, yeah. Okay, good. And then, of course, when I was a bit older, I liked to watch the Bruce Lee films. Uh, that also had a, a big influence on me. Mm. But then uh, when I actually started martial arts was, was a bit later. So when I went to university in uh, Southampton, in the south of the UK, uh, one of the students, he opened a, a karate dojo and he also did uh, kickboxing. So uh, at that time, so uh, when I was 18, I was, I was very shy, uh, not so self-confident. So I thought, yeah, if I, if I can train these two things, it will help me boost my confidence, become a stronger person. And so I decided to start both at the same time. And the, the kickboxing was more uh, fitness-based. We did some sparring, um, a lot of exercises, uh, but there was, there was no competitions, nothing outside of the dojo, if you like. It was just uh, training for fun, getting the experience, uh, getting the confidence to, to not being worried about hit, uh, and also getting the confidence to actually uh, be a bit, I would say, aggressive, but in the sense of a, a sparring match. Mm -hmm. uh, the karate was, uh, it was uh, Shotokan karate, and it was uh, also orientated for self-defense because at the university there were, uh, there were a lot of teacher students and also a lot of uh, female students. And uh, the teacher, he, he was making a lot of emphasis on self-defense as well as the, the Shotokan karate. Uh, part. So there we did, uh, apart from the training, we did uh, gradings, uh, could go to a few seminars, uh, but I, I didn't have the courage to, to go to a competition at that time. Well, so you, uh, you mentioned that uh, you started it so that you can build up kind of this confidence and ability to uh, defend yourself. Uh, was that, was the choice of going to the karate and kickboxing, um, was that pre-mediated? Did you think about, okay, I think I need to find something to help me, or did you see them and then you say, hey, well, I have this issue too, uh, maybe I, maybe it can help? Like, which one went before the other one? Did you find it first, or did you think about going first? Uh, I think it was a mix of the, the former, and then I wouldn't say the latter, because uh, at the beginning of the interview university, they invite all the students uh, to, to see what kind of associations are available. Uh, on the campus, and uh, I saw that uh, this student was going to open a karate and uh, kickboxing uh, dojo in the university campus. So I, I immediately uh, jumped on that occasion, if you like, I plucked up the courage, I decided more or less on the spot to, to register and to start straight away. Mm. Uh, one advantage I had in my studies was I could go to France for one year because I was studying French. And I could also train in a, in a French dojo for one year. That was also a, a very a good experience for me. Uh, and after this year in France, I did my last year in Southampton at the university. 
And uh, I always remember the last lesson from my karate sensei. It was a, a sort of a, a farewell present, if you like, after the, uh, after the normal training. He took me into one corner and he was pushing me, uh, attacking me nonstop, really making me sweat. Uh, just, I just had to react as naturally as I could. Don't worry about being hit. Just try and do the best I could. He put me under a lot of pressure not in an overly aggressive way, not to uh, debase me or anything like that. Uh, the lesson was really to, to test me, test my limits, uh, see what I was capable of under, under this pressure. Uh, this is, uh, this is a, a memory I always keep a lot uh, throughout my Budo career. Yeah, well, looking back at something like that, you could probably see the benefit. What, what was it like at the time? Was it like a surprise kind of thing or? Oh yes, <laughs> totally unexpected, yes. <laughs> because it was the, it was my last lesson. Uh, it was also his last lesson because we started unfinished at the same time. Hmm. And uh, so I was, it was totally out of the blue, totally unexpected. Uh, but afterwards we, we could laugh and smile about it. And uh, there was no hard feelings, no, uh, no injuries. Uh, it was a, a good experience, I can say. And then after university, so I, I needed a job, of course. And I found a job in Switzerland, close to the city of Fribourg. And uh, so I moved there shortly after university. So this would be 1998, so 22 years ago. And, uh, oh, sorry, I first have to go back a little bit between university and going to Switzerland. So uh, after the studies, I moved back to my parents' place. And then I wanted to continue karate. So I found a local dojo and went there a few times for, for training just to keep, keep the rhythm uh, until I found a job. And then I found a dojo wherever that would be, wherever I would be working. Uh, but in one of the trainings, unfortunately, I had a, an accident. I got hit in the eye quite hard. And uh, so I, I temporarily lost my eyesight and I had to have a laser surgery to correct it. Uh, and that was a, a, quite a scare for me, actually. So I uh, so, sort of, I was anyway taking a break from karate because of the injury, but uh, also that scared me so much, I was thinking of, of stopping, so. But I moved to Switzerland in 1998. Uh, so for me at that time, it was, I was in a totally new environment. I'd never been to Switzerland before. Uh, a new job, my first job, after my studies, my first job as an adult. So I also took it as a new chapter in my Budo life, if you like. And I, after I moved, I looked around what there was available in the area. Uh, there was Tai Chi. Uh, so I, I tried Tai Chi for a few weeks, but for me, I didn't have a, much of a connection with it. Maybe it wasn't dynamic enough uh, compared to karate. It was very much more uh, a different uh, world compared to karate and tai chi for so so i looked for something else uh, then i found a dojo in bern uh, that had kendo and yaido so kendo i'd known about uh, i'd seen a little bit on tv uh, some documentaries i'd also read a little bit about it yaido i didn't know so much about i had read about it but it wasn't something that stayed in my mind so I went to look at one of the trainings. Uh, I liked very much what I saw. So I, I started both uh, straight away also. Are, are, is anyone there that's still there now at that time when you went to see? Uh, Kendo, yes. So mostly the older students, they, they are still there. And Iaido, uh, my sensei is still there and one or two of the older students. But as you know, in the span of 22 years, a lot of people come, a lot of people go. So uh, Kendo, I did for six years. I got the grade of uh, Shodan. Uh, why six years? Because after six years, I think I was doing something wrong. I had problems with my elbow. Uh, so I decided to, to stop Kendo and slow down Iaido uh, to get it better. But uh, after a year had passed, my motivation for kendo uh, also dwindled away. Uh, but I continued with the Ido. So uh, I was still in the Budo world. 
Then uh, I also practice judo. Uh, judo I started in 2009, uh, but I will I will come back to that in a moment. So at that time when I started uh, kendo and iaido, so this was uh, 1998, of course. The the situation in Switzerland was uh, the it was a bit fragmented in the association. The uh, in Swiss kendo and the iaido association, we have kendo, iaido, and jodo. And at that time, in the especially in the iaido uh, domain, the um, there were clubs in the German speaking part of the country. Um, they knew of each other. They had seen each other from time to time in seminars or a competition, but there was no real uh, collaboration uh, between the, the clubs and the groups or not so much. Uh, but this improved with the years because the, the people in charge, they, they managed to bring the clubs closer together and also get more uh, organization together of competitions, of seminars, of gradings, uh, also working together more for big events like uh, championships. Uh, I also had an influence in that, uh, which I will come to in a moment. If I move to the situation today, so we still have mainly dojos in the German speaking part, but also now in the Italian speaking part. So, if I look back in the beginning of uh, when I started the IDO in Switzerland, so as I said, it was a bit separated everywhere. Uh, we didn't have uh, really any high grades. I think Yondan was the highest grade we had at that time. Uh, we had a lot of lower grades. And, and since that time, uh, we've progressed to, uh, we have three uh, Rokodans in the IDO and three Rokodans in Jodo. And plus we have many uh, people in the categories in between. So we can see, especially in the, the time I've been active in the IDO here, that the, uh, there has been a very good progression uh, in the quality and in the grades. Uh, I wouldn't say the numbers because the numbers of people are, are pretty much the same as they've always been. It's been quite stable, um, in, which is good in a good way. Uh, of course, we always hope there would be more people active but at least it's been stable and it hasn't uh, dropped down a lot. So we've had a lot of input in Switzerland for Iaido, Jodo and also Kendo, but I'm, I want to talk mostly about Iaido and Jodo. So apart from the, the collaboration between the, the different clubs and the, the club leaders, uh, we've also had a lot of help from uh, outside. So we have regularly uh, European sensei coming to, to help us. Uh, we've been lucky also to have uh, some Japanese sensei uh, for seminars and competitions and also a lot of Swiss people a lot. Uh, some Swiss people have been fortunate enough to travel to Japan to train with the, the senseis over there. Uh, before I forget, uh, in Switzerland we have uh, two, the biggest two groups of Iaido are Muzushinden and Jikiden Aishinryu. Uh, the Muzushinden group is under the line of Ishido Sensei, and the uh, Muzujiki no Naishinryu is under the line of Oshita Sensei and Morita Sensei. Okay. And Could you talk briefly about how these senseis were connected to, to your groups, and then also who are these other European senseis that, that are helping you, and how did you the situation in Switzerland connect with them as well? Sure. So the the three Japanese senseis I just mentioned, they, I found out later, they already worked closely together. Uh, for example, in the European uh, summer seminars, uh, very often there would be these three senseis and some others, of course, too. But they, I found out later, they, they'd already been working a lot together. And of course, if we follow the lines from the Japanese sensei to the European sensei down to the, the Swiss sensei, we we're all uh, in the same line, if you like. So um, this is how we were able to, to invite the sensei uh, a few times to Switzerland to give seminars, also have them uh, for uh, European championships one time in Switzerland. And going the other way, we've also been fortunate to be able to go to their dojo in Japan and uh, train there. Uh, uh, some people can manage to go every year 
Uh, some people have been only a few times. I've myself have been twice to uh, Ishido Sensei in Japan. So uh, apart from seeing them in the summer seminars or seeing them in Japan, we, we also see them uh, sometimes in uh, other seminars in Europe or competitions, of course. So, so you say that they come and they've been actually helping with the, the Swiss group too, with under these lines. But how was that original connection made? Like, were there people that said, were there people that are already training with some of these European senses, or did they say, hey, we need some help here. Could you come and visit? Like, what, what was the origin of that connection? So as I said, uh, in the end of the 90s, um, the Iodo and Jodo uh, was, was at a very, I wouldn't say low, low level, but not at the level we have today. And because of the geography, uh, we could get help uh, in the beginning from a sensei in South Germany. This is Karl Danica sensei, um, who was getting help from sensei in, uh, in Holland, for example. Uh, Louis Vitalis sensei is a well-known sensei in Kendo, Iaido, Jodo. And a student of his, René van Armersport sensei, also was helping Carl. And through Carl sensei, uh, we got connections to these Dutch sensei, Louis Vitalis, René van Armersport. And then with time, with other sensei in Europe, um, for example, uh, Peter West sensei, Faye Goodman sensei, they, there were connections um, from the Swiss people who went to, for example, England for seminars, they got to know Peter Sensei and Faye Sensei. And Faye and Peter also had a big influence in Swiss Iaido, especially at the beginning of my Iaido career. Uh, Peter West Sensei would be quite often in Switzerland, uh, and he was a, a big help and a big influence when I started Iaido. And uh, we, we still keep the connection with these Sensei, of course, uh, be it when we go to the UK or in uh, championships, or also if they come to Switzerland, um, there has been a, a very regular contact uh, over this long period of time. And you might have heard, um, we have a, a spring seminar every year in Switzerland in Maglingen. It's become a sort of a famous seminar, if you like. Uh, it's a very big international seminar. And um, there we have other European sensei uh, from France, from Italy, uh, Sweden, uh, Germany, uh, so we have a we have a regular group of European senseis coming to us, and we also go to them in the sense of seeing them in seminars and competitions. And because of this long term relationship, then we, we've been able to to build up the level of Iaido and Jodo uh, that we have today. And, so, uh, so I had heard about that seminar from uh, Sida Ying from yep. Sweden. Yes. Uh, he mentioned it and he mentioned that you were one of the drivers of that yeah, yeah, event. Yeah, yeah, could you talk about that? I'm always super interested about how these things start, it gets created and then how you like to, how, when, when you're an organizer, you look at things and it's like, I can improve this, I can improve this, I can change this. How have you seen it evolve over time? And so talk about the beginning of getting it started and then how has it evolved? Yeah. Well, I, I wasn't the person responsible for, for starting it. It was my predecessor in, in charge of the administration in the Ido and Jodo. Um, it started as a side seminar to a kendo seminar in Switzerland in the spring. Um, Peter West was coming uh, to this seminar to help us, but it got, it got bigger and bigger with time. So uh, it was necessary to, to separate it in terms of space and time from the Kendo seminar. And the, the person in charge of that time uh, was able to move it to Maglingen, which is one of the Swiss national sports centers. And they have a very good infrastructure. They have uh, lots of training halls, they have accommodation and restaurants. For, it's ideal for people who are in a seminar for a few days, need a place to sleep, to, to eat. Uh, we're not far from the city of Biel. Uh, it's a very uh, c convenient place to have a seminar, especially a big seminar. Uh, apart from Peter Sensei, uh, we also had Carl Danica Sensei, as I said, helping us in the beginning. And then with time, uh, more senseis were coming from the European countries. 
around us. And uh, every year it was getting bigger and bigger. And we, we were having the same senseis come in regularly. Uh, sometimes we were able to have a Japanese sensei come also, uh, which was making it more and more attractive. And this is why it's, uh, it's a long-standing, uh, well-known, uh, I would I like to think an important event in the yearly calendar in the Iaido and Jodo uh, community in Europe. What do you think is the draw? Is it just more people are doing Iaido in Europe and then they started coming or was there some word of mouth about something unique about this seminar that people enjoyed coming to at the city or the event itself? Uh, I think it's more word of mouth. Uh, also the, the experience of the people who come, they quite often they bring uh, new people with them the following year because they, they liked it so much. Uh, we, we do the best to, to, to make the people comfortable, to give them a, a good quality seminar, uh, which, which uh, many people know it will be because of where it is. It's a very nice place. It's a very, uh, it's also not expensive. So it's good for the, the wallet. And also people know the, the senseis that come because in the, as you've, as you've probably gathered with the other interviews, uh, we, we all know each other very well, the students, the, the teachers. Um, so they, this is also a, a plus point for people to, to come to the seminar. Um, but there is maybe one uh, event that particularly uh, sticks in people's minds about Maglingen and the Maglingen seminar. And that was in 2008, we were able to host the European championships there. Uh, this would be the end of November, beginning of December. Uh, and uh, in that year, we had a, a lot of snow. It was very cold, a lot of snow. Um, and a lot of people still talk about it today. It gave this magical atmosphere of being uh, far away from everywhere, uh, in the mountains, in the cold, in the snow. And um, I will talk a moment about this, uh, this championships afterwards. But uh, a lot of people still have good memories about this, not just the, the competition, uh, but everything that was outside of the competition part uh, that they enjoyed a lot. But I mm. can go into a bit more detail about that afterwards. Yeah, just one thing more general. You, you said that you try to make this a quality seminar and seminars in, in general, it you can make it as detailed or as broad as, as you want. Like the organizer could just say, I'm gonna rent a place, Sensei's going to come now. Okay, Sensei, do it. When you think about organizing a more quality seminar, what are these additional details that, that you think about, that you think uh, really make a difference? Well, I, I'm not the person who's going to decide what is going to be taught. Uh, the, the format of the seminar is, is pretty much like other big seminars in Europe. So it can be training uh, Renmei, uh, Koryu, examinations, uh, apart from that, um, we try to do a, a sayonara party, uh, or there could be something special that, that we can do uh, during the seminar. Um, that's, that's basically the, the, the plan, and then, then it's the senseis who, who then go into more detail about what they want to be taught, what they want to see, what they expect uh, us to learn. Okay. So I'm, I'm the guy who just uh, reserves the hall, uh, handles the registrations. Uh, I do a lot of the administrative work uh, behind the scenes. And during the seminar itself, I am uh, people see me running around uh, <laughs> trying to do this and that. But mm. it works and uh, people are very happy to come uh, year after year. So this is something we intend to keep doing. Yeah, no, I, I hope to come one day. To participate as well, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, did you, what did you want to move on to? Okay, uh, you asked about memorable experiences. Oh, yes, yes. Um, so I will go through a few things, but in chronological order. So the, the first was in 2002. It would be my first uh, summer seminar in the UK. And I was going there uh, alone. I was going to take my Shodan exam in Iaido. So uh, it was a bit daunting for me. Um, 
but I was quite surprised when I got there because when I was in the UK, I, I hadn't heard of Eido. I'd only read about it. Uh, I didn't know uh, that there were actually clubs very close to where my parents lived and where I was living with my parents. So this was a big eye opener for me. Also, there are a lot of uh, participants in the seminar. So I found out there are a lot of uh, members practicing Eido. Uh, this was, I, I was quite shocked actually. <laughs> So I didn't expect to, to discover this. And also I discovered there are a lot of uh, participants from other countries. There were a lot of members in other countries who also came to the seminar. And I also found out, uh, I discovered how, how big actually the EIDO community was uh, at that time. It was also the first time I met Oshita Sensei. Uh, it happened by accident. I arrived early in the seminar and the day before the official start was a, a Jikiden uh, training in the evening. And when I arrived at the seminar site, someone directed me to, to where the training was. Uh, I didn't know it was courier training, but uh, Oshita Sensei, he, he found out I was from uh, Shinderyu, but he had a good laugh about it. He said, don't worry, find a space, train, enjoy. <laughs> and uh, that's how I got to know Oshita Sensei. <laughs> <laughs> then the next memorable event for me is now when I come back to the European Championships in 2008 in Magellan. Uh, why was it memorable? <laughs> for, for many reasons. Uh, firstly, because I was a helper behind the scenes and also I was a, a competitor. So it was a big eye opener for me to see both sides of the part of a competition. I had only been to one Euro European Championships the year before as a competitor, uh, but now I was really seeing the whole picture being involved in the, the organization. Uh, and on top of that, I broke my finger the evening before the competition. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we had a, uh, a Christmas party for our dojo. And as part of the party, we were bowling and I got, broke my finger between some bowling balls but uh, it didn't deter me from doing the competition. I didn't get very far. I won uh, a few matches. I was happy with that, but <laughs> that's something uh, I will never forget. But apart from that, as I said, the, the atmosphere was, it was quite special because of where it was, because of the weather. Uh, there were some participants who'd never seen snow before in person uh, or so much snow, especially. And uh, I saw there how, how friendly uh, everyone was with each other, how everyone got along with each other. Doesn't matter if they, they couldn't communicate so well because of the language barriers, but uh, the, I could see because of Eido and Jodo, uh, this was a common bond that, that brings people together on a regular basis. And it's still something we see today. And it's something that I appreciate very much uh, in our community. So the next event would be in 2019, so last year. It's the second time I went to Japan to train with uh, Ishido Sensei. Uh, I wasn't alone. We were three from our dojo, uh, including our Sensei. And we, we had a really good training. Um, we were with other students from Ishido Sensei, uh, students from his dojo, students from, from outside. Uh, but uh, we, as always, we, we learn a lot. He gives us so much information, so much help. Uh, we really have a lot of homework to do after, after uh, visiting him. And uh, I didn't know uh, until just before we went, but he registered us for a, a Koryu Taikai in Japan. <laughs> I've never done a Taikai in Japan before. Uh, this was also a very uh, interesting event for me because, firstly, because of the size. There were over 400 participants, which for me was really huge in the European Championships with maybe 200, 250. And I was also really impressed by the, the organization because uh, the competition started and finished within the space of a few hours. They had uh, eight Shiaijos. Uh, it was only a knockout competition. There was no pool fights, but I was really impressed by the speed, how they managed to uh, get everything 
organized, tables, chairs, get the people organized, get the, the matches done and get everything finished within the space of four hours. Uh, I hope in Europe we can follow this example and be really, really efficient. And also impressive at that event was the demonstrations. Uh, before the competition, there were demonstrations of different martial arts, uh, not just though with swords, but also with an aginata, with, uh, with sticks, uh, with, um, uh, with a hammer and sickle, uh, it, some things I'd never seen before. And it's very, uh, very nice to see uh, firsthand. So that was my most uh, memorable experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think uh, Aurelian mentioned that in, in his interview that yes. that Taikai is being, yes. because it's, yeah. it's so rare to have something that's all core you. If you're suddenly thrust upon that, how did you, how did you think about what, what you were going to do? Uh, well, I have to think quickly, of course, which Koryu Kata uh, I wanted to do. Uh, we were able to, to train those with Ishida Sensei before going to the competition. So we, we got a lot of help. Um, I, it was a bit daunting because apart from never doing a competition in Japan, I thought, oh my gosh, the, the level is going to be really, really good there. Uh, but we, we actually surprised ourselves, the, the four of us. We, we, did, we did better than we expected. Uh, so this is also a good boost for our esteem in the Ido. Mm -hmm. So what else did you do on that trip? You, you went to train with Ishido Sensei, you participated in this Taikai. Yeah. Um, well, we, we got stuck in the hotel because of the, the typhoon that they had. <laughs> They're the very strong typhoon, but apart from that, we we could do some sightseeing, uh, eating good food, uh, shopping, of course, uh, and enjoying the time outside of training uh, as much as we could in Kawasaki. Okay. Uh, so you you mentioned earlier on, and even here, that uh, these seminars bring together a lot of people, and even though you can't really communicate fully. Um, you still create these strong bonds. Could you talk about a few of these bonds that you've been able to create, uh, whether it's inside Switzerland, in the UK, or anywhere else, people from Europe? Yeah, so uh, if I look at my... Uh, if I don't look at the sensei, but to look at other students. Um, so a lot of the people, we know each other, and. I know them, they know me for, for a really long time uh, because of going to the seminars, being in the competitions, having to face the same uh, stress, uh, be it an examination stress, be it uh, the pressure of competition or having to, to fight each other. Uh, they, um, as you know, it's if, even despite the fact you have to fight against each other, you're afterwards you're still uh, going to be friends after that. You don't have to worry that uh, you will fall out if, if one wins and one loses. Uh, you know, you, you give your best. Um, and this is the this is a very good spirit, I find, in, uh, in the Iido Jodo community and also in other Budo communities too. And with the, the Sensei, um, so as I mentioned before, we, we know each other for a very long time. So the Sensei were able to help with our progression uh, during our Iaido and Jodo uh, life. And uh, there is one of the sensei who comes very often to, to, to Switzerland. Uh, I will talk about him in a moment. And we have a very uh, strong bond together. And also because of the, the Maglingen seminar, if I come back to that, because we have the same se senseis coming very regularly, then this also creates a, a very strong bond between not just myself, but with the students and the other teachers. Yeah, if you could talk about specific people and use their names, it, it helps kind of bring out what you actually have a connection with. If you just kind of say, this sensei did this, and there's this individual that blah, 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 it's harder to get a feeling of like what that relationship is. Yeah. So there, if I look at the, the European sensei, as I mentioned before, uh, Peter West uh, had a, a big influence on my early days in the Ido. Uh, he he could help me a lot, uh, especially because of the language. 
because he could uh, explain everything in English, of course, to me. And um, he helped in the progression of my lower grades. And he, he also has a lot of knowledge that uh, was very interesting to, to hear and also to look deeper into, uh, not just in the technique part, but also the, the outside of the technique part of, of the IDO. It is also very interesting and that we also, also shouldn't ignore. We also have to pay attention to that. And because he was coming to Switzerland regularly, uh, he could also follow my progress quite well. And he, he helped me make the first steps uh, along the, the Ido way. So I'm, I'm always very uh, grateful for that. Um, more recently, well, not more recently, but on a more longer term, uh, an important sensei for, for myself and for Switzerland is uh, René van Armersfort sensei from Holland. So René sensei, he is a, he's been a very big help for Swiss Iaido and Jodo. He, he's very regularly here for seminars or for the Magdalene seminar uh, or sometimes for the Swiss championships also. He's been a very big help, not just in terms of Iaido and Jodo itself, but also for some organizational matters. Uh, this is a very big help for us and also uh, trying to understand the, the way things work in the, the broader Iaido Jodo community. Um, it's, it's very important for us. Do, do you have an example of what are these things that you need a little more clarity on and what, a, what, what could be complex about uh, just this community? Okay, so there's lots of encouragement, of course, to participate in the seminars, uh, also the competitions. Uh, this applies to, to us. It doesn't matter which level we have, be it beginner or more advanced. Yeah, there is. Uh, he he motivates us a lot to to attend these events, to try our best, and also to prepare ourselves uh, for these events because the preparation itself is just as important as as the event itself, of course. Because what we what we do beforehand is a help for whatever happens after the event. It's a, an investment in uh, in our training, also. Uh, he's also been a help in, in how to, as you say, how to behave, uh, how to, to organize certain things that we, that we don't step on toes, that we, uh, we try to do things in the correct way that's expected of us. Okay. Uh, is there another person you want to talk about? Yes, uh, two more people. So, of course, my Iado sensei, Stefano Ferro. He's one of the six dans that we have in Switzerland today. He's been my sensei since the, since when I started Iaido in 1998. So he knows me very well. He knows my habits. Uh, he knows what I'm capable of. Uh, I also know what he expects of me. So I, I try to do my best to, to do what he wants me to do. Uh, this is a, uh, it's not easy. Of course, it takes a lot of time uh, and also a lot of patience from his side because I'm sure uh, even if he's explaining the same things to me uh, quite often, he's luckily, uh, he has a lot of patience to, to not get quickly upset if, I, if I'm not able to do something uh, straight away. Uh, I'm very grateful for this. And also he's a very big help uh, for organizational matters, especially as he's the national Iido coach for the Swiss team. Uh, so, we have a very good uh, collaboration in terms of preparation for the European Championships. And of course, as a friend, uh, he's a, a very uh, important person in, in my life. Uh, another person is my Jodo sensei. Uh, this is Bayat Bela. He's also a sixth dan uh, Jodo. And there again, a uh, person with a lot of patience, uh, a lot of energy, uh, giving me really a lot of help to to help me progress in Jodo. And also he was the, uh, the predecessor before me, the person in charge of the administration of Iaido and Jodo in Switzerland. So he was also able to, to help me a lot uh, with organizational matters. And it was from him that I, I took over the Magdalene seminar 
that I took over the organization of the Swiss Championships, that I've, I've taken over the um, general administration of Iaido Jodo in our association of organization of seminars, uh, which I've been doing now since uh, 2009. Well, what have you learned from doing all that administrative work? And what, what kind of motivated you to start getting involved more in that? I found it something totally new. It was uh, nothing I'd been involved in before. Um, it was also something very different to, to my work. Uh, so it was, it's, it, it still is a very stimulating experience for me. I'm, I'm doing things that I, I don't have to do in my, in my day-to-day -day work. So it's, um, I have to think differently. I have to organize things differently. It's, uh, I've learned, uh, to discipline myself, uh, not just for training, but in terms of uh, being organized and uh, knowing what to do. Of course, in the beginning, uh, I need help. And then with time and experience, uh, things become much more easier. Uh, it's also helped me to become more confident. So not just training helps me being confident, but also all these behind the scenes organization has helped me uh, become more confident as a person. Oh, that's interesting. Um... In what way do you see that happening? Because in the training, there's a few things you you have to perform in front of other people. So over time, you you can understand that, okay, that's not too bad. Uh, you get a little stronger, you get more control of your body. So you feel more uh, confident. How does this uh, behind the scenes administration, administrative work help you? Yep, uh, so have to be proactive, have to be uh reactive thinking on the spot a lot um have to know uh or have to uh depending on the situation uh act immediately in the best way that i can um uh, that's uh that's basically it <laughs> and apart from that of course um it's enabled me to to have contact with uh, a lot of people uh, in switzerland outside of switzerland who are in the Eido Jodo community, and uh, not just the uh, senseis, but also uh, uh, students. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. So it's like, because you're doing this administrative work, you have to interact with more different people. And over time you realize that, oh yeah, I can talk to pretty much anyone. We're all trying to, trying to reach the same goal, try to make the best uh, situation for everyone else. So yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because they they have the same challenges I do uh, in terms of organization, if they're people who organize things. Uh, so we can also give each other input or advice. Um, this is another a nice collaboration we have in the community. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so so if we have a few questions here revolving what have you been able to bring from your practice to your work or for other parts of your life. Um, we could talk about that or we can talk about think the other way around too, maybe things that um, you've learned or you've done in your work or outside of Budo life and you've been able to bring in, how these say, kind of melt. I would say it's more the, the former. Um, so my my job is, is about planning, production planning and for uh, for uh, Iado Jodo, I'm also involved in planning. So th this is the, the only area where there is a, a common factor. Doing all this organization um, helps me become uh, disciplined. Um, disciplined in the fact that I know I have to prepare this, this and this before the event. And also when the event is taking place, I need to be able to do this, this and this. And also after the event, there are sometimes some actions that need to be done. Um, but with all the experience I've had since doing it over the last uh, 11 years, it goes much more easier now. And the, the thing I have to learn to do now is to, to delegate. Uh, I have to get other people more involved to help me. This is a, this is a weak point I have. I, I do too much things to myself and I need to, to get help from uh, people. Uh, because especially if one day I, I stop doing this, 
or I'm unable to organize something, then it has to be able to continue uh, with other people who are able to do the work. So this is something I'm working on. And oh, something yeah. that I get re reminded about from other people too. Well, I, I think what a lot of people don't realize, the challenge is that a lot of things that we learn to do as organizers are because we, we saw something that was missing and then we decided to learn it ourselves to do it. So it's not something that you were passed on. So if, you, if it was something that was written down and you learned it because someone else had previously written, then it's easy for you to hand over. But some of the things that you, you learn and you do, you don't even think about. It's not conscious. It's just like, oh, something needs to be done. I know I'm mm -hmm. just going to do it. And you're, you naturally know how to do it. So yes. the problem with the delegation is you don't even know what are these things that you need to tell people to do. No, sometimes not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I had a question that I thought would be interesting in this situation, because you, uh, grew up in the UK, but then you spent more, I guess, half your life now in, in Switzerland. But more. <laughs> yeah. How, how do you see uh, the, the general cultural differences between those countries and how do they resonate? How does your kind of melding of those two, uh, resonate with the actual with Japanese culture like what, what is it that you think connects you with arts like these uh, apart from uh, liking Japanese culture um, would you like me to to speak more about the Swiss culture or sure yes okay yes, please yeah. so the especially in the community of Yado and Jodo the the Swiss people I know they're, they're very open so they, they like to, to travel a lot. Uh, so we, we see this when they go to the seminars or to visit other senseis in Europe or go to uh, Japan even to train with the, the Japanese sensei. Um, and we also have very good relationships with our European uh, colleagues in the community. So this openness is a, is a, a big, big factor uh, for us. Um, we, we like to, as a Swiss person, I'm, I'm talking, of course, so we like to try our best, uh, be it in a, a competition or a grading, we can be uh, persistent. Uh, this I see in many of my colleagues here. They, they, they try their best, even if they, they fail, they're, they're not going to give up, they're going to try again and again and again, uh, keep on trying until it works. Um, they don't get frustrated by this, uh, they, they don't give up. So this is also a, a nice factor. Um, I'm not Swiss enough to say, but maybe if I look at Switzerland's history, and there are a lot of uh, mercenaries, a lot of fighting men in the country, maybe this has, has carried down through the generations and is still something that, that is there today. Mm -hmm. This uh, persistence, this never giving up, this is, uh, this is something important for learning Iaido and Jado. All right. Um, if there's nothing else in your notes that are specifically you want to talk about, I'd like to move to the rapid fire questions. So these are just um, interesting short, short questions that you can answer as fast as you like or as slow as you like. Um, so I'm just going to randomly choose one. Maybe, uh, how about one from, the, the quote. So do you have a quote or proverb that you live by or practice by? Yes. The rule of the five Ps. All right. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. <laughs> nice. So, so, so some English people know this. Uh, so basically, as I said before, in my work, I'm planning for the Iada Jodo, I'm planning so I've really got into the habit of, of preparing the things as well as I can in advance. So when there is something to be done, uh, a seminar, a competition, whatever, that I uh, have the situation as much as under control as I can. <laughs> of course, there is something that can happen unexpected. And there we have to have this flexibility to, to react accordingly. Uh, get help if necessary, do the right thing at the right time. Uh, this is a rule I try to live by for Yodo Jodo, for my work at home too. This is something uh, that's helpful uh, for daily life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
What have you changed your mind over in the last few years and why? So we all have different expectations from life, from Iado and Jodo, if we want to talk about this. Um, so I've learned not to expect people to, to want the same things as I do, to have the same motivation as I do. And that's totally fine. We, we are all free to give as much as we want into it as we want. We also get a lot back, of course. Okay, what we, we give is what we get back. And this is something I've, I've learned over the last few years, not to try uh, to, I would say, force people to, to do like I do, or my sensei does, for example, but let the people do what they want to do. It's very important that they enjoy what they do because this is a hobby for everyone. Okay, this is not our job. So it's very important that we have a lot of enjoyment from what we do. And in this way, people are free to choose how much enjoyment they want, how much energy, how much investment they want to give for the Ido and Jodo. And I know what I want and I'm happy to, to continue doing that. And what other people want to do, that's also okay with me. And I'm also very happy to, to help them achieve that happiness in that way. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. If you could meet uh, a sensei or a practitioner that you've never met before, either alive or passed away, and you had a day, day to have a long conversation with them, regardless of any language barrier, who might that be? <laughs> Miyamoto Musashi. I've, uh, I've read his books, uh, Gori no Shou, uh, is the one I remember, I can't remember the other one. Um, but it would be interesting to, to know uh, in more detail the, the things he was thinking about and he experienced uh, during his time. Mm -hmm. Like how he came up with these theories and yes. concepts? Yes. Cool. Hey, have you watched like movies about him too? Is, it, is this something that kind of about his history that is interesting to you? Uh, nothing that springs to mind, nothing that I can remember. Okay, um, so another question, uh, just broadly, have you listened to any of the previous episodes of this? Yes, some of them, yes, yes. Are, are there any topics or ideas or things that were brought up in some of those episodes that you want to comment on or build on uh, from your own experience? There are factors that are common for, for many of us is the first, the, the fascination with, with uh, Asian martial arts I've, I've noticed. Um, and also the fact that many of the students, they, they actually started something totally different in the beginning and they've migrated to Iado and Jodo. Uh, I find this uh, quite interesting. And it's something we also see a lot in the, in the dojo and dojos uh, today. A lot of uh, new students come from other uh, disciplines. Um, this is something uh, quite interesting. And also uh, the fact for some people, the, the struggle of the, the balance uh, between the daily life and the, the Buddha life, especially with people with family or jobs, it's, uh, it is a challenge. It's important to find the, the good balance in our life that, that we are satisfied with. Is that something that you struggle with, either in the past or more recently? Um, no, not at the moment, no. <laughs> I've, I have a good balance. I have a, a job that lets me invest what I want to invest in the Budo, be it in the training, be it in the organizational part. Uh, it's, I have a good balance. Okay. Uh, last question for fun. If someone were to open your computer and open YouTube, what would they see as recommendations for Matthew to look at? They would see uh, Iaido videos. Uh, they would see uh, cat videos <laughs> because we have two cats. 
uh, they would see a video as maybe about a BMW motorbike because I drive a BMW motorbike. Nice. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so to, to wrap this up, do you have any closing comments or uh, things you want to say to the audience or just uh, things you want to share? I'm very uh, honored actually to, to be able to, to do this. This is the first time I've been able to do something like this. And I, I think it's uh, very nice of you to, to have started this, uh, despite the fact that we, we know each other in the community of Viado and Jodo. Um, we don't necessarily know each other so much or know what history we have or what we're going through so much. Um, so we don't necessarily have so much time together in the seminars, in the competitions to, to be able to uh, share um, this information with one another or to be able to get to know a person about their, the history of the person, about what the person is experiencing so much as we are able to, to listen to in these podcasts. So I think this is very nice thing. Uh, it's a nice thing that you do. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and for being open about it. This wouldn't, this wouldn't work if people weren't uh, so generous in talking about their experiences. So I need to thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Cool. Thank you so much, yeah. Matthew. You're welcome. Thank hopefully you very we'll, much. Yeah. Hopefully we'll weekend. see you in person sometime. Okay. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode because we have a lot more exciting conversations to share as we explore the world of the traditional Japanese martial arts. The Inside Look podcast is available on most common podcasting platforms and on YouTube. Remember to subscribe to not miss out on new interviews as they are posted. We're always looking for feedback to improve, so please write us a review or drop us a line at podcast at tokushikai.ca or on Facebook and Instagram at tokushikai.canada. Until next time, thanks for listening.